Uh, happy spring and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen. I'm the Program Manager for the Recycling Market Center and will serve as your moderator today. Before we get started with the presentation, we'd like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series. The focus of today's webinar is on organics recycling during disaster recovery efforts. And today's presenters are Gene Bonnetal and Mark King, who I'll introduce in a moment. Following the presentations, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of the webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and PA Recycling Market Center websites. The presentation slides can also be obtained using the handout upload feature on your webinar control panel. So we're gonna start off with Mark King and I'll, uh, we just bio here quick. Uh, Mark's an environmental specialist for the sustainability division of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. He has a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Maine and a master's degree in zoology from Southern Illinois University. Mark is a member of the Maine Compost Team, a collaborative interagency group consisting of representatives from Maine, DEP, Department of Agriculture, State Planning Office, and the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, where he developed an expertise in composting. In 1997, Mark served as one of the founders of the internationally acclaimed Maine Compost School and currently serves as director as well as actively participating in course instruction. Mark provides ongoing technical assistance to new and existing compost facilities through facility siting and design support, operations assistance, and compost process troubleshooting. Mark has worked with all levels of compost facility size and design, and has developed an expertise with medium and large scale facilities. Currently, he's promoting statewide composting of pre and post consumer food residuals as an alternative to costly landfill disposal. Okay, Mark, I'm turning over to you. Sounds great, thanks a lot, Wayne. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to share my experiences in the Virgin Islands helping with the disaster recovery. Okay, let's see if I can get this to advance ahead. Uh, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about kind of the background of how I got involved in this whole process. And then I'll get into my actual trip down when I, when I helped them over uh, eight days. Uh, some of the management options that we developed as a result of my trip, a specific plan that we left with, and then uh, the challenges that were associated with every action plan that we developed and a final prognosis. Everybody's aware of the hurricanes that ravaged uh, the, all the tropical islands in the Caribbean this past September, but uh, several were, were hit pretty heavy, several complexes. And what happened was we had two category five um, hurricanes that both kind of attacked within weeks, a couple weeks of each other. And as a result, they were not able to properly recover from the first hurricane only to be whacked with a second one. Um, Irma specifically uh, was really hard on St. Thomas and St. John, and then Maria kind of uh, devastated St. Croix itself. So, what happened was that the governor immediately established a debris management team and pulled in all his cabinet officials from the various uh, state agencies that are involved in natural resource management. Uh, Carlos Robles, the Commissioner of Agriculture, Don Henry, the Commissioner of Planning and Natural Resources, similar to state of Maine environmental groups. Uh, Nelson Petty was Commissioner of Public Works and then Roger Merritt, uh, the Executive Director of Waste Management. Carlos happened to actually be one of my past compost school students. And he reached out to me in October and said, you know, we've been holding these calls and uh, it appears that composting might become something that we're really interested in. Would you be willing to sit in on the phone calls? And of course I, I agreed to do that. that, that was not a problem. And um, one of the issues with early on was that FEMA and the Army Corps wanted to come in right away and they wanted to push air curtain burning because they felt that it was the fastest, easiest way to deal with the debris because it did not require any size management. You didn't have to grind anything. You basically just took it as whole and put it through the system. 
However, we all agreed that that wasn't the best choice given the island's natural climate, general humidity, and the high propensity of folks that have asthma and other respiratory disorders, that it would be really hard for that smoke to be liberated from that area. So we kept holding calls and more and more and more we zeroed in on, on composting with a decent option. So Roger Merritt sent out an RFP uh, to try and see if we could get some interest from stateside uh, compost companies. And we looked at everything from uh, massive front end loaders to turn static piles to vessel systems, including the Gore system. And much to my surprise, uh, the, the lowest bid came back actually as a complex and vessel system, the Gore system. I was real surprised that the front end loader didn't win, but uh, regardless, uh, that was the one that was chosen. So we sat down a little more and we talked about other options that we could possibly do. And uh, I was sort of challenged one Sunday night to come up with a list of 15 different options. And we went through kind of what could be and, and uh, so I hung up the phone and I was sitting there puzzling it through and I came up with about 10 really good options and fired them off uh, in an email. And about five minutes later, I got a phone call that said, so when can you come down? So it became an immediate invitation. Uh, but there was some caveats. They didn't have any money to pay me as a consulting fee, but could cover all my travel expenses and uh, lodging and food. So I talked to my department. I indicated the, the problem that they were having down there. I indicated that our school was international. This was one of my past students and asked if they would be willing to sponsor me in uh, exchange, they would be reimbursed for all my travel expenses. And my department pretty much jumped at the chance of helping out another entity and to show the things that we had learned in Maine. So we very quickly hammered out an agreement and I was down about two weeks later. So as uh, I said, I was there for about eight days. And so between December 3rd and the 8th, I visited the sites impacted by the hurricanes on all three islands. I started out on St. John. Uh, spent a couple days there, then I went to St. Thomas, spent a day and a night there, and then finished out on St. Croix. One of the amazing things to me was that these hurricanes happened in September, and when I arrived, 60% of the island still had no power. Uh, when I stayed on St. John the first two nights, the places I stayed at did not have any power whatsoever. Uh, so it was quite amazing. So that was something that definitely uh, made, made me realize that we were up against it. So St. John, uh, when I arrived there, uh, came into the bay. And, and if you look at this slide and, and sort of take it all in, you can see immediately off to the left, there's part of a building sitting on the beach. And then if you zoom in towards the shoreline, you can see a couple of boats lying on their sides. Uh, those boats actually were moored in the bay and were carried by the hurricanes on the shore. This uh, tended to be a really common kind of picture that I would see. Uh, lots and lots and lots of damage, uh, boats. And one of the amazing things was that people were so demoralized by this hurricane system that came through these, these two category five, that they abandoned stuff. And there are actually boats that were in a stockyard that were just all piled up. And I asked uh, the Army Corps guy what they were gonna do. And he said, well, they have 30 days, and if they don't come and get them, we're going to put them to a big grinder, and we're going to take that out as demo debris. And I was absolutely blown away by that. But people just, they, they left. They left everything up and, up and just sort of took off. Another thing that I noticed, especially on St. John down by Coral Bay, was they received six inches of rainfall an hour. And so the amount of erosive forces uh, was just insane. So they lost a ton of topsoil and had some severely eroded banks. Uh, the house on the right actually was about ready to fall down onto the highway. So that became a number one concern for public works to try and, and fix that uh, system. Other things that were very demoralizing, people lost roofs or completely lost their homes and businesses. The picture on the left is a restaurant that uh, was completely demolished. Pictures on the right are houses that were basically without a roof, and a lot of them missed most of their walls and windows as well. So we're talking about some pretty severe wind damage. 
other things that happened that it's hard to see in this picture, but when the hurricanes came through, the landscape was completely brown. All the all the beautiful less vegetation had been ripped from the trees and it was completely brown. But what this picture attests is that even though you see all the damage, if you look on the horizon, there's some places missing rooftops and the green lush nature shows that uh, life finds a way to recover. So with that comes hope. And that's what a lot of the folks felt like is that they were going to hang in there because their environment is able to come back. So why can't we? So there was a, there was a tremendous amount of hope on the islands and, and that was very inspiring to me. The other thing that I was completely blown away by was that when people left, any animals they had, horses, pigs, cows, dogs, cats, they just let them go. And they figured they'd be better off if they just could try to find some food somewhere. So many of the, the places that I visited, there were large debris piles when people were trying to clean up. And around those debris piles were lots and lots and lots of scavenging animals, pigs and chickens and goats and burrows and dogs and cats. And uh, Jesus, the uh, Humane Society of the United States, actually established several outposts down there and made an effort to try and recover a lot of the domestic animals uh, to get them out to be adopted. So there was a, there was a lot of humanitarian and animal related activities. So after taking all that in, I then went to St. Thomas and uh, St. Thomas had other challenges as well because it's, it's uh, one of the premier attractions of the uh, Virgin Islands. So getting that back up to speed was super important for the economy. And once again, I found debris piles everywhere. And the problem with the debris piles that I found as a composter was that people were not separating clean organic debris and construction demo debris. Oftentimes I found, I found the piles intermingled and that made it a real huge challenge for composting because nobody's going to want to have compost that's full of all kinds of construction demo debris. So that, that was definitely a challenge for me. Another thing that I noticed was that uh, I visited quite a few of the landfills and they had tremendous exposed slopes. Uh, this is Bovani Landfill uh, in St. Thomas and that led me to um, believe that we could do some creative landscaping with, with a lot of this material to help kind of um, alleviate some of this damage and prevent further erosion and losses. Specifically in this case, there's a mangrove swamp down below that's very protected and we wanted to, to prevent the landfill from impacting that adversely. This is the mangrove swamp itself and you can see it's a pretty, it's a pretty beautiful uh, habitat and they're very uh, protected and, and uh, coveted by the islanders. So that went into my craw and I, and I, and I started figuring out more things that I could do. Uh, Finally, I saw some positivity on the island uh, when I got to an Army Corps grinding site and saw that they were grinding the demo debris. Now, the first grind was four inches, and I told them I said that was a little bit too big. I wanted to see between an inch and a half to less than an inch and a half would be preferred in order for us to get at least the mulch material, if not a compost material. So they immediately upon hearing that went to a, a finer grind, which was really helpful and gave us some real beneficial uh, aspects. This other site uh, located on a red hook uh, with all clean debris, they, they finally got the message and uh, this material is all ready to be ground and uh, to be composted. Uh, so then after having some real positive experiences on St. Thomas, I finished out on St. Croix, I took the seaplane and uh, that's where my mind was blown yet again. Uh, one site called Body Slob had over 650,000 cubic yards of storm debris. And it just, as far as the eye could see, there was just gigantic piles. And unfortunately, a lot of that material was also intermingled with construction demo debris. So it was very frustrating to have all that really good, rich organic material, but yet have it be contaminated with other materials. Then things started to look a little bit brighter uh, over at Anguilla Landfill. I noticed severe areas of heavy uh, plumpage and erosion losses. And that's kind of cemented in my mind that maybe we can use a lot of this organic compost and mulch 
to help stabilize these slopes, to help regrow vegetation, to help improve organic matter. And I talked a little bit with Roger Merritt, the executive director of the waste management, and he felt that was awesome. Uh, he also said that they had some biosolids that they like to throw over the side. And I said, let's not throw it over, let's mix it with the compost and create a really excellent topsoil that we can then broadcast across the sides of the slope and really have an advantage. So that started his wheels spinning as well. And, and so we were starting to have some real positive impacts. Then we went to the Renaissance site, which is a, um, a limestone mining site that was used for many, many, many years. And it had beautiful access coming in and it had, uh, they call it caliche there, uh, beautiful flat areas of limestone. And that's where we decided that we could possibly set up a compost operation, the Gore system, because they had three phase power. And so we started the process of putting a site that could handle large amounts of material. And that, that got the process going forward with that as well. This is just another shot of, of that Renaissance site. We need some old debris from a previous hurricane that basically was just set in a pile. Now, what's really important about that pile is that the governor absolutely positively did not want to see that happen with this material. So it was imperative that we come up with creative ways so that at the end of this process, there would be no piles like that remaining, but the material would be utilized in a really effective way. So that was the beginning of my challenge on what we could do. This was a port right also in St. Croix that allowed folks to come in so we could easily get rid of some undesirable stuff and simultaneously bring in some compatible feedstocks if necessary. So this was a really bright, shiny moment as well. So as far as the plan goes, I sat down after looking at all this information, assessing it, and came up with the following plan. The first thing was I wanted to grind the debris down to an inch and a half to two inch minus and to start out with mulch that could be used everywhere. I also wanted to take the contaminated material and put that through and use that mulch, but only around the landfills. So instead of trying to separate painstaking, separate all the plastics and other stuff out, we just ground it all up and we created a, a stabilized material that would fit all around the landfill where it was okay to have some contamination in your mulch. The next thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to build a berm between the lower road on Bovani landfill and the edge of the mangroves to intercept any potential uh, erosional flow, any potential leachate, anything that might come out of the landfill and catch that and prevent it from getting down into the mangrove swamp. I felt that was really super positive and that would give the governor something to show the people that you know we're gonna jump on top of this and we're gonna protect these mangroves because it's so important to us. Uh, the other thing was that I wanted to push the really clean material to be a value-added agricultural product. So I wanted to have um, a large portion of it composted so that we could have that as a top dress and organic matter additive. And then I also uh, wanted to use a mix of either compost or mulch out at the landfills on the side slopes uh, with mixture with some biosolids to help revegetate those eroded areas and give the vegetation a chance to catch that and prevent further erosional losses. We also created berms along the top of the landfills to help direct stormwater flow such that it didn't get channelized and create erosional streams to begin with. Then uh, St. John and other island, islands that had significant slope damage, I requested that we be able to uh, apply the grindings for slope stabilization and also to heavily vegetate those areas and use the, the mulch as an opportunity to keep the seed in place so that it could, it could catch and keep those slopes stable so that we didn't have further, further erosional losses. Then we also talked about uh, Siltsock, which is a company that uh, is, is pretty heavy in the south, uh, east, and also southwestern United States. And what they do is they take compost and mulch and even wood chips themselves, and they stuff them in socks that are either biodegradable or made of a fairly thin nylon material. They stuff those socks full and they then become an erosion control sediment. The ones that are biodegradable, you leave them in place and then they just disintegrate and go away, but they prevent any sediment from leaving the site. 
So we talked to that company and uh, set up a process where we could get those uh, filled out. However, we still had a ton of material. So then I approached uh, the director of um, the Waste Authority and once again said, what about daily cover? And he said, you know, daily cover is a great idea. The problem is that we have a lot of landfill fires due to the way that, that we failed things in the past and we'll occasionally get a fire down the landfill. And so I prefer not to put a lot of carbon in there that could in turn combust. And I said, well, what if we mix it to such a ratio that it won't flash and it won't support combustion? So we did a couple of different flash tests and other, and, and found that a mixture of 20% of the uh, wood chips and 80% soil would not support combustion and would still allow them to save a lot of money by not having to import soil onto the island to use as they recover. So we were able to drop that by 20% and we felt that after we use it a little bit, we could probably increase the amount of um, mulch in there. So that was a really positive thing. So there's a chart of the silt socks just to give you an idea how they work. They, they are super awesome and they do help prevent erosional losses on site. They're great for stormwater management. Uh, this is just the, the biosolid site out by the uh, Anguilla landfill. And as you can see, they use drying beds and they get, they get really stackable material. So our thought was to mix this and create a really fertile topsoil that could help enhance growth along the banks. Uh, and this is just a stabilizing slope idea. We wanted to go from what was on the right to what was on the left, a much more stable bank. And you can see on the right, they've tried to apply compost, but they're not holding it down appropriately. And then alternative daily cover was just a no-brainer for me. And a lot of places in the southwestern and southeastern U.S. use it up to 50% of the mix. So it was it was definitely uh, something that I thought would get rid of a lot of material in a positive, financially beneficial way. However, there was a real large problem with uh, some of the challenges. The first challenge, of course, was basically political. Um, there, there was a certain amount of money, but it was going to burn up at the end of March. And so there was a lot of interest in doing something, but we didn't want to grind all the stuff up and then find that we couldn't use it all for whatever reason, because once it was ground up, it's a lot harder for the curtain burners to work. So that was a bit of a challenge. Uh, as I stated, the landfill fires was a concern and a challenge that I had to face. And so we talked about doing the flash test and got it down to a fairly reasonable number. Uh, termites, that was a really big challenge because a lot of landscapers had used mulch in the past from other hurricanes and there was naturally occurring termite nests all over the islands. And when they're ground up, the termites aren't necessarily killed. As a result, those would propagate in the mulch and then if you use it around your house, you would then have a termite problem. So composting was an obvious choice because it does help to kill uh, the larval stage of these guys. And so that was another big push for that. But the other thought was there were several uh, companies on the island that made sort of colored mulch. And they felt that if they were to take that mulch system that has sprayers and put an organically based um, non-pathogenic or non uh, toxicologic uh, type of insecticide that will kill the larvae, it'll target the larvae, but not other animals around your home. Could they run the mulch through the grinder and spray it simultaneously? And so we reached out to BASF company and they provided some information, uh, but I'm not aware of what's happened with that. And then the final challenge, which was real difficult to deal with, was all the contamination in the mulch because people didn't want that. So we had to relegate that use to the uh, landfills themselves. Now finally, what about the prognosis? Uh, the uh, FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers definitely are giving compost a really hard look. Uh, the island working heavily. Uh, there's an Island Green um, Living, uh, Green Living Institute that's looking to push um, composting through all the islands. So I think, I think that's gonna take hold. Puerto Rico recently pledged to go that way as well. So like, like to think that we had an impact there, but I think that they saw the light. And there's definitely a lot of um, 
sort of informed opposition to air curtain just just because of the potential for the air uh, contamination and the, and the negative health effects from persistent burning. And uh, finally, uh, the USVI government is looking to try and give the whole cleanup plan back to FEMA and uh, have them kind of take it over. That way they have uh, less of a potential to be left holding uh, the bag, so to speak. So that's the latest on what's happening there. And I think that's all that I have, Wayne. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, I understand you might be logging off shortly. So uh, we have a couple questions already for you. So we'll, we'll, we'll pose them right now, if that's all right. Okay. Um, yeah. This one attendee uh, mentioned that the, the EPA responders for Katrina recommended burying the chip vegetative debris to eliminate fire hazard and use it later for alternative daily cover. And so I think you kind of it mimics what you did in, in Virgin Islands with with blending it and and, and yeah. reducing the, the fire. Yeah. Okay, and they also. Yeah, and I, I Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, that, I was just saying they also use it for topsoil and compost blankets. So uh, it's a very uh, proven technique. It, it is. And, and the biggest concern that I had with burial, because that was, that did come up, is that anything that you bury with the intent to dig up, you never do. You know, once you bury it and grass grows over it or whatever happens, you forget about it. And we didn't want to see that happen either because that's the same as disposal and, and disposal is not a good option for really valuable reusable organic material right okay all right so uh so thank you mark appreciate that that presentation so uh we're now gonna turn it over to jean and so i have to make her presenter and unmute her Okay, Jean, you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, can you bring up your presentation then? Uh, my presentation is up. So my screen, yep. There we are. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, while you're getting that ready, I'll provide your bio. Jean has worked at the Cornell Waste Management Institute in solid waste education for over 20 years, first working for Cornell Cooperative Extension in Broome County, and then for Cornell Waste Management Institute. She works on composting feedstock from food manure to animal carcasses. Currently, her time includes work on food scrap, manure and carcass and butcher waste, composting, education and research. Character characterizing waste streams is important to be able to separate and determine value added purposes for different residuals. Compost quality and consistency in the marketplace is also a high prior priority, as well as encouraging use to build healthy soils and redistribute nutrients. Jean's previous experience includes working with different agencies, including the U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, U.S. EPA, New York, uh, New York State Department of Environmental Compliance, and landscape and greenhouse industry. Uh, Jean received an MS degree in education and communication from SUNY Binghamton in 1991 and a BS in biology from Utah State University in 1984. And she's an AAS in natural resources from sunny Morrisville. Okay, Jean. Thanks, Wayne. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but looking at um, responding to livestock disasters, what happens with livestock in these disasters? In cases of the islands, I think Mark may still be able to talk, um, but in cases of the islands, uh, I think everything was probably buried and not composted um, and there wasn't you know there weren't as many losses of animals and certainly not you know there were people but that's a different situation um, so we'll just talk a little bit about um, you know different times that we would have that we would be responding to um, events, winter storms, floods, barn collapses, disease outbreaks, fires, hurricanes. Recalled meat products tend to be a large chunk of meat. So I sort of added those in because it's usually a disease um, that, you know, it's usually something that would make people or animals sick and they've recalled it. So it needs 
to be dealt with. Um, there are endless tsunamis, there's endless events that end up with, um, with dead stock. And I usually call this one a, a dead stock talk. Anyway, um, so emergency response. People are usually wondering, you know, how do people go out on these emergencies? How, you know, what happens? You know, who's in control of what, you know, if people want to volunteer to come out and work on emergency, you know, emergencies in different um, locations, especially where we do have a lot of uh, either disease outbreak or something like that. Um, who's in control? Well, when it's uh, livestock diseases, it's um, the State Department of Ag, so everybody's is called a a little bit, you know, it's their Department of Ag or, you know, they're you, use, they use different acronyms for their Departments of Ag, but it's that, it's that group that's responsible. Um, it's not the farmer directly, it is the farmer or the people that own the animals, but it's also the state steps in and looks at that. If it's a if it's a disease that's zoonotic, that can spread easily, that is has a high, you know, high chance of being becoming problematic, then um, and the state asks for help, then APHIS, um, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, is the group that would be asked to come in and deal with that. Now there's an APHIS vet in each state, at least one um, in each in each state, and you know they also can respond um, if, if they're being called in to do that. If it's um, a wildlife situation, it's usually the Environmental Conservation Department or you know they're and they have different acronyms as well. Um, but when it's wildlife, it's usually though that um, we do a lot of work with um, DOT and roadkill ends up being under their jurisdiction kind of. So if we're dealing with that, then it may be wildlife, it may be, uh, it may be environmental conservation, but it also may be like a DOT or something like that. Um, but if there's a, if there is a disease that has the chance of spreading like avian influenza, um, USDA APHIS um, has taken the lead if they're asked by the states to come in. So that's, it, it seems, you know, it's hard to figure out kind of the protocol and who comes in first and, and all that, but it's generally, it's emergency responders. But these are the, the people if there's an animal disease outbreak. So veterinarians, local emergency responders, um, subject matter experts. So people that know how to dispose of, of material. And I'm gonna talk quite a bit about composting as a disposal method in these situations um, throughout this. But subject matter experts are people that know, basically in this case, know how to compost and know how to compost a lot large amounts of, of um, dead stock. Oops, did I go the wrong way? Um, USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service has standard operating procedures. So these didn't come in early on, um, there was an avian influenza outbreak that I'm going to talk a little bit about in 2015. And you can see the dates on these standard operating procedures are 2016, 2017. So we actually developed the, the, the standard operating procedures after we had some experience responding. And that sounds a little bit backwards, but um, you do as much as you can to set things up, but then 
disease outbreaks don't happen every day. You don't always have time to practice. So, um, or even know some of the problems that are going, that you're going to encounter in some of these outbreaks. So the, the more, the, um, live, the avian influenza standard operating procedure was developed in 2016 and the livestock one was in 2017. And that wasn't in direct response to an outbreak, a disease outbreak, but we knew that we needed to be thinking about that and thinking about that. So APHIS um, led the charge on, on these and a lot of us um, said we'll help write them. So we, we developed some guidance on those. So the, the avian influenza outbreak, um, it's, it was our first in the United States, our first highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak. Um, and it was a lot of animals. Um, when, it, when all was said and done, there were 50 million turkeys and chickens that were, um, that, that we had to manage in some way, shape or form. They were in, in many states um, and different people had to go in and try to direct operations in different places, if that was the case. Now, you know, this is not our first disease outbreak. It's not our first time that may, we may have wanted to consider composting for dead stock. But generally, if you think about it um, in your communities, when there's flooding and things like that, our, and, you know, barn collapses, our knee-jerk reaction is just to bury all that we have but 50 million turkeys and chickens um and they were from small to 35 pound you know a couple pound to 35 pound animals um so you have to really think about that burying that much would be difficult and this outbreak started in december of 20 2015 December, the end of the, it, so let's say January. It started somewhere around January. Um, so we're going through winter time. We're going through having to get, work our way through all of the details of, of you know, different weather situations and, um, and be able to get some of this work done. The animals sometimes are alive. I'm just going to take you through a couple of slides um, of what happens in some of these. And this is from slides from different outbreaks, all the avian influenza ones. Um, but they have to um, euthanize the animals. And in many cases, they had to euthanize, they euthanized the animals using a firefighting foam. It's an approved way to do that. But that's another part of the whole process that has to be accounted for. So people had to go in. The people in the picture there on the bottom are uh, foamers. And the picture on the top are, are, is the farmer, one of the farmers. So we have to have personal protect, protective attire. We have to think about all of that um, beforehand and have that ready. And in a lot of these outbreaks, you know, the community is trying to rally and get things going and figure out where they're going to get all different aspects from protective clothing to uh, carbon sources to other things. So in this particular case, before people can go in, now the farmer obviously was in there already. Um, when before they even knew that there was an outbreak of avian influenza. But the, the subsequent people that are coming on afterwards need to have protective clothing. So they need to think about the clothing, the footwear, fit testing for respirators, um, face protection. And that can be anything from glasses to full face masks to other things. Other, other aspects, you can put a full hood on um, 
to for protection. And all the people that go in, all the the subject matter experts that are direct that are tr that are directing and coordinating some of these efforts have to have medical clearance to make sure that they're not going to get in trouble when they get in there, when they get into the sites. Um, it was interesting in this situation, as I said, everything's not organized and everything is not dictated. The farmers were given doctor, like doctor blue coverall doctor gowns that closed in the front, not protective, but that's what the health department had. That's what they ended up with. The rest of us ended up with Tyvek and you know rubber boots and masks and goggles and and all the other stuff. Um, the farmers are, already had been exposed also to this, so just you know looking at the differences here. Um, readiness, you know, are we ready for this outbreak? Um, we tried. I mean. There were people, there were groups that had been meeting for years to talk about this and talk about what do we do when, if, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, you, you're figuring some of the details out. Um, but it's really important. Every farm is different. Like, every person is different. Um, you've got to go in and assess the situation, see what's going on before, you know, all of the all the hands come in to help and all the equipment come in, comes in to help. Um, and we did as SMEs, we um, did this before we ever got on the site. We talked to the farmers and or we talked to the people that were going to be in command of the situation. Can we get a hold of water? Can we get a hold of, you know, you know all the, the things that need to get rallied before we even travel out? Up to these the places. Um, speak with the managers and owners. If you can, if you can get those people, if they're available to talk to, then you get an idea of what's happening, and you can provide educational materials as to what we expect to have happen through this. And that would be, in this case now, the standard operating procedure. This is probably what we're going to be doing, you know, read through this so that you're prepared and we can gather the materials that we need. We, as I said before, we had to deal with the cold climates. When you have frozen animals, putting them in carbon sort of just keeps them frozen. So there are different things that we do, that we methods that we can use to um, deal with um cold climates and that's either using hot sludges or hot, hot warmer materials trying not to deal, have to deal with dead or um, deal with frozen animals and if we have to deal with frozen animals um n understanding that they're going to be sitting there for a long time frozen and then when the ambient temper temperature comes up then they'll start the composting process but it doesn't really start, the process isn't going to start until that temperature comes up there. Carbon sources, and I really want to talk uh, about carbon sources with waste managers, recyclers, all that, because there's a big disconnect um, with where to get carbon. Um, I, I'm thinking that I'm talking to a lot of recycling coordinators right now and people that are dealing with recycling and solid waste. Uh, we all know where the wood chips are. The farmers don't know where the wood chips are. They don't know where the, you know, they know where straw is and hay and things like that. But this is something that's absolutely essential for us to have um, to be able to coordinate and make the composting process happen and happen effectively. As I, you know, as I said, the solid waste people, the cable people, they know where all the road clearing stuff is and all the chips are. And really that's one of our best uh, amendments that we can use when we're composting dead stock. This is a process when we're composting it. It's a process where we don't do any turning or we do very little turning. So we really want to build the pile properly with good porosity so that we don't have to turn 
at any point because if we turn a pile of you know 60,000 birds it's going to smell early in the process it's all also going to liberate um, pathogens potentially so we really want to be very careful about how much movement happens and really build our piles the best to the best of our ability so that the air will naturally flow through the piles so there are wood shavings um, there were wood shavings on this particular farm and they hadn't been used for bedding yet so that was used some of the bedding material that's mixed with litter with with um, feces uh, that litter was used there was also um, some pay, some uh, this particular farm had sunflower seed that they were bedding turkeys with and the sunflower seed was terrific i thought maybe it would compact and we would have problems with it but we didn't uh, and that's because the the sunflower hull kept its integrity well so that was something that was on the farm we didn't have to bring wood chips in and this was in north dakota and there really weren't a lot of wood chips available in that area so you're always looking for carbon that's available the bottom right hand side picture is um, a hot manure pile these farmers these the poultry farmers in many cases just stack their litter and let it compost and that pick the person on top of that is me and i'm not very tall but five two but it was a huge pile of of um hot compost that we were able to use as some of the amendment in the in the process and if we did we didn't have frozen birds or cold birds in this situation but if we did that hot manure just jump starts the whole process and allows that process to to go from zero to 60 in no time and that's really what we want it to do we want to get it within 12 to 24 hours we want that temperature to be 133 degrees or above 133 degrees to about 155 degrees um, as fast as possible because that means the compost process is working and we're the faster we can process the animals the less problem we would have to, with disease spread so as i said in the in the midwest east, west uh west of the mississippi uh were all of the outbreaks or i think all of the outbreaks there were 50 million turkeys and chickens equaling miles and miles of windrows in many states so um that was one of the one of the outbreaks um, also, when we're when we're working with this kind of stuff, we have to make sure the the water is up on the ceiling there, and the picture on the on the right reminded me. But we have to compost the water, the feces, the litter, any feed that's on site, because the feed may have been the source of contamination that wild birds may have gotten into um, the feed and contaminate it. So we have to make sure that we've composted all the organic matters in those windrows so that we are working towards sanitizing those farms. Um, another one I'll just go through briefly, and this was an emergency response. Um, we had a, a brucellosis outbreak in north of Albany in New York, and we we wouldn't have known that there was a brucellosis outbreak except that somebody got sick so the one of the farmers that was in that area got sick and the doctor picked it up and they said oh boy this is a problem so and the brucellosis suai can obviously be contracted by the human in that case but also dogs and um sometimes other animals so um we had to respond to to this uh, outbreak. The details, the outbreak was identified in early August on several non-industrial farms. So it wasn't factory farms. It was small, in some cases, kind of wet farms. So it wasn't ideal to even be stay on the farms. 
um, first batch of pigs um, tested positive, and actually the vet school uh, digested some of those in an alkaline digester. Um, but with 270 pigs, there was no way to, to do all of those, to, to be able to transport those animals a couple hundred miles um, and have those composted. We visited the farm that was the, the largest farm. Um, negative pigs, were they were taking them for rendering at first and we would encourage that. Um, but then the rendering, the renderers said, no, we don't want to take them anymore. And it's a, it's, oh, obviously it's a choice. So we have to make sure that, um, you know, it doesn't have to go into a food or feed stream. It's just, you know, they didn't want that liability. So it ended up being about 270 pigs, two different events of composting, um, anywhere from four pounds to 100 to 600 pound um, pigs. So the disposal options for there, you think about, okay, we're waste managers, we look at things in different, you know, where can we put all this stuff? Um, the rendering was, was a good option at first. Uh, landfills, in New York State, we have a hard time getting our landfills. All our landfills are private and they really have reservations about taking diseased animals. So generally, they won't take them if there's a disease outbreak or there's a lot of animals that die at one time. Um, compost on the farm. The farms were really wet and the, there were, you know, some pretty good pig styes there. So very wet areas for the pigs to be in. And we just felt that it was too dangerous to, to compost them there. So they were actually hauled to another farm where the, comp, where the farmer had a lot of experience with composting cows. Um, the disease wasn't contagious to cows, so we were okay with um, with moving them. They were also nowhere near the cows um, on that farm, so we kept everything very separate. They were all brought in in stock trucks and trailers, and then they were euthanized on site. Um, access to carbon. It was, that was tough because um, it was going into a weekend and they're like, okay, let's do it now. And they're like, did you secure some carbon? And so we went to one of the landfills in New York that wasn't that far away and they allowed us to um, take, take a lot of uh, wood chip from there and um, use that for part of our bulking agent. We could have used two truckloads, two, two tractor trailer loads of of um, the carbon from there, but we weren't able to get it because of timing. Uh, it was also county fair time, so we had to be aware of that and, you know, the potential for this farm, the farm wasn't very far away from county fair, so making sure that there wasn't a problem there. Hmm. Sorry, that's a dark slide. Um, we need to contain the diseases. Um, so it's hard to know when you've killed the disease because we don't have any, you know, we, we, we have quite a bit of experience in time and temperature and things like that, but, but we just don't have rules, laws that cover this. So, um, all in all, we decided that we would go with EPA 503s um, because they're looking at biosolids. And if we can kill all the pathogens in the biosolids, then we should be able to kill the viruses and pathogens in the 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 even if or the the mortality piles. So that's what we did. We um, and 
we had a lot of experience with it. Well, down in Virginia, they have a lot of experience with low path AI and having to depopulate some of the farms. So they had done some work with low path AI and worked out some protocol with that. It actually is, you know, these, these um, viruses are, are pretty weak. So we can kill them pretty quickly, especially in the composting process. Um, by just elevating the temperatures and wiping them out. Um, so, so it doesn't even take that long. But for public, the public has to be sure that, you know, they know, know that something's happening and they're seeing big piles of stuff and they're like, well, no, we're never going to use that again. And the farmer's the same way. Nope, we're not going to use that. We're just going to leave it in a pile someplace. And at first, that's what happened with a lot of the material. Um, we've gotten past that and a lot of the material is being used and we have fact sheets on even the nutrient the benefits of using some of these composts um, because we have killed the disease and we we've wiped everything out the one thing that we that we don't know how to kill is prion diseases so mad cow and that's really disabling that protein chain but chronic waste disease, mad cow, things like that. So we're not encouraging use of this methodology for those animals. That would be a different situation. But for all other viruses and pathogens, we're in pretty good shape. Um, I had concerns about the, fan, you know, whether, well, first, should we compost inside or outside? Some of the barns, it was impossible to compost inside the barns in some of these situations. With the pigs, we obviously pulled those out and brought them to another farm. With the poultry, we really wanted to keep them in barn because then you're not liberating any more of the pathogen. As you move things, that potential is there to liberate. And in the, on the farm in South Dakota, North Dakota, in particular, the wind never stopped blowing. So you were gonna be able to get um, pathogen pretty far or virus pretty far away so that was a concern so as much as possible we do want to do disease outbreak inside um, barns when we can't then we just want to do as little movement as possible as little moving of those piles as possible so that we don't liberate anything um, the fans all barns have fans big fans and I wondered about that that because we left the fans on for animal and people health when we were in there. Um, but I thought, boy, those fans can send um, send a dust cloud pretty far. So I think they probably could send, you know, uh, viruses out and stuff like that pretty far as well. So just things to take into consideration. Um, when are outdoor piles safe? Um, we try to keep them as safe as we can with as little movement as possible and, you know, right outside of the barn if that's possible as well. So we're moving them very little. We didn't move the, with the avian influenza outbreak, we didn't move those piles. We wanted temperature in those piles. The thermophilic temperature is 133 to 155 or so. Um, for the as much of a two-week period as possible so we were leaving them in many cases for 14 days within the barn and then if they didn't reach temperature we did need to manipulate them in some way and and get those temperatures up so that we would kill the 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 virus ultimate disposal um using the compost so using the compost uh, reusing it, and I have another slide on that where we can, oh, sorry. Um, hmm, sorry about that. That was a weird transition. These are, the pigs are, um, pigs are alive. They're being, they're going to be euthanized there, and they used captive bolt in that situation. Um, then the, the pigs were moved by leg chain, dead, but by leg chain over to the, the carbon base and laid into the carbon base. Uh, we had a large team of veterinarians from around the country, uh, mostly east, 
but but there were people from as far south as Georgia that had come up to help um, that knew the disease and were working on it. Um, and so we laid the laid the pigs out and just put them in layers like we would with um, any of the lasagna methods that we use. So carbon, there's wood chips underneath them. Then we did put some some straw. We we had some hay, haylage and silage around, so we used that at some of the layers. As I said, we didn't have as much wood chip as I would have liked in the beginning. They were taking samples and sending those to the labs. One of the pigs in this particular situation was sent to Maine to, um, to I think it was a stud pig um, that was going to be introduced to other pigs. Luckily, it never made it to the other pigs, and the, the the pig was destroyed. And Maine, the Maine compost team, worked on that that pig, and that was a it was a I think it was a 2,000 pound pig. Um, so they disposed of that, but we needed to know if any pigs moved out of any of those farms, so that we'd know whether the disease could have been spread or not. Um, back to the 270 pigs, this is one of the windrows of pigs, and we did top it and top it pretty effectively with uh, the, the haylage. Um, that worked well. It kept the odor in, and because the, the carbon sort of scrubs the odor so that wild animals don't come in and dig into the piles. If there's a lot of flesh hanging out of the piles, then animals will definitely be attracted to it, especially out in, a, in an area like this. What's happening in this is the pile heats up um, and the heat rises, the CO2 rises. Um, so the CO2 is going out and then the oxygen has to come in because the microbes are doing the work in there and they're aerobic air breathers just like you and I. So the the processes and natural circ air circulation around the pile and through the pile um, so that we don't have to do any turning, especially early in the process. Um, we went back to the pig piles. Uh, this was December 7th. We went back there and there was just very little discernible tissue, soft tissue left on these. There was a little bit of hide, a little bit of hair but everything had reached temperature and that was only two months, about two month, two and a half months um, that they had been in the pile. So that was really good and the, the vets were very excited about that because we're always leery of putting large chunks of, of flesh in a compost pile. We track temperatures in both. Um, and we want to make sure, as I said, that the temperatures are getting up above above um, 133 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's pretty important so that we do have pathogen kill. Um, the When we were building these piles, it was 95 degrees. I ended up dumping a whole bag of ice down my, down my Tyvek because I was so hot. Um, there and that's something that we have to worry about also in these heat situations is the people that are responding have to be able to um, be fed and be cooled or warmed or whatever needs to happen depending on the outside weather. Disposal of the end products. Um, we reuse those end products as a base for another situation. We wouldn't use in a disease outbreak we wouldn't do that. Um, we would just finish that up and then get rid of it because hopefully we wouldn't have a disease out outbreak in that time frame. Um, spread it on the field on field crops and it can go on field crops, not food crops, so feed crops, um, corn, things that are harvested above the ground. Um, Haylage, you have to be very hay, you have to be very careful about how you're spreading it on hay and the timing has to be right at certain times a year so that you don't have potential for contamination. Remove large bones um, and spread it so it can be spread on the field. If you have large bones in there like you know the pig skull and the pelvis 
um, are usually pretty good size and those they just don't break down that fast so sometimes those have to be moved out uh, we also use a lot of road, roadkill compost on roadside projects because it's low public contact areas um, so we can use the material um, spread it in, in for forestry applications as long as it's not not a disease that's going, you know, well, and, and you should have killed disease and check to make sure that we've killed the disease um, before it's spread. But it shouldn't really go, just for safety's sake, it really shouldn't go on human food consumption crops. Um, that's just taking a little bit ex more risk than we probably should. So um, just to wrap up, the you know the SMEs or the people that are interested or that are that are willing to go out and do this stuff. This is hard, heavy work. It's not easy. There's a lot of negotiating in these things, um, making sure that people are. You got to remember that people are are upset because they've just lost a lot of animals. Their animals are maybe being killed or maybe they're already dead. But it's an emotional thing. So we really have to do. We do really have to think about how people are doing, what they're doing, um, and how they're responding to all this. Then we say, well, but we need to have wood chips and we've got to have somebody pay for this stuff and we have to have somebody, generally with some of these situations, the governments are paying for these, uh, these disease outbreaks so that they make sure that, that everything's taken care of. The wood chips, we didn't have to buy the wood chips in this particular case, but we did have to ship the wood chips. And you know, that alone cost multiple hundreds of dollars just to get them from point A to point B so that we could be able, we would be able to use those. Um, so it, there's a lot to keep in mind as that as the person that's that's going in there and directing operations um in these cases in a lot of cases we're teaching the vets that this method is working and that's pretty neat because for so long our knee-jerk reaction has been to simply bury them and when we bury things we put it six feet closer to our water table and we really can't afford that with composting we can we can make sure that none of it gets into the water table and and it becomes a, a positive soil amendment um, for our things. The Cornell Waste Management Institute has a lot of resources online, um, and the, we have natural rendering, which is livestock and mortality composting, how to do all those things. We have um, one for poultry, we have one for horses, and we have one for roadkill. So, um, it's actually some of the roadkill composting has been implemented in many states um, in the U.S., including like Yellowstone, where we've composted buffalo and other things. So um, I think that's that's the end of my talk. Wayne. Wayne, are you there? Hello? Hello. Okay, there I Wayne. am. 
Yes, sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, that, that was my end. I, I was muted here on my on my headset. So anyway, uh, we do have some questions, Jean. Okay. So uh, what would be the process for anaerobically digesting dead stock? Anaerob uh, it depends. If there's a disease outbreak, um, we're not trying to do anaerobic. We might do alkaline digestion, but there aren't that many alkaline digesters um, in the country. So that's more. So of a if we wanted to, if we wanted to put it in a manure digester, is is that what we're thinking? I believe that's what the the, the, the attendee is is asking. Right. If you wanted to put it in a manure digester, I don't think there's any way that you could do it without chipping it, because you would ruin your you have a million plus of two million dollar uh investment in that digester and that would be you you probably would hurt your digester if you put a whole cow in there mm -hmm. so chickens you might be able to but the feathers don't break down as quickly and with an out with an with an alkaline or a, an anaerobic digester you do need to dewater that the solids and stuff, and it just wouldn't. I don't think you would have an easy time of doing that. All right. And you would have to have some kind of a chipper on the front end of that to to convey them into the digester. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Like when they they bring in food scraps, they have a grinder there typically to size reduce the material before it gets introduced into the the digester. <laughs> Right, and a, a pig, you know, a 2,000-pound pig is a lot bigger than <laughs> than any food waste is going to be. Right. Yeah. I, we've talked about it. We've discussed it because we've been doing mortality composting for 20 years or so. Um, so we've, we have talked about it, but I think that people would be risking their digester, and those are expensive things. Yep. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, Gene, for the use of finished compost, you mentioned it could be reused as base. Can you explain what the, the base means? Oh, uh, to put underneath the animals. You have to have a 24-inch, well, with, with pigs like this, we would have an 18 to 24-inch base that goes down underneath. You can see when we went back, if we went back a couple of slides, um, it showed the bases. There's a base there. Uh, there's a base here that the cat that the pigs are being laid on, and that's very important. So that's the base, and it, we can use it as the bottom, but we don't. You want to use that as the top if we're going to reuse it, because if we use it for top material, then we're going to have bones sticking out and all kinds of other things. And when we have bones sticking out of piles, it attracts attention, and that's not the best thing. We do a lot of mortality composting um, in the U.S., but we try not to uh, to advertise what we're doing because it's legal. We can do it in it pretty much every state except California. California has not accepted um, composting of mammals, only of birds, um, but every other state has uh, it has an allowance for composting mammals. And birds. Okay. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up now. So again, this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, has been recorded. It will be made available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you'll join us for next month's webinar. And please visit the NRC and RMC websites for schedule updates. And thank you again, Gene, for, for this presentation. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day.